Welcome to Sketching Encounters. This is Sibylla Irwin. My guest today is Fred Roll from Subarctic Alaska Sasquatch. He has an amazing website and interactive map. And if you have not been to his channel, his YouTube channel, you've got to go there too. Um, and I will link that. I'll put that link down below. Fred, thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And you just uh, please share with us whatever you'd like, because I'd, I'd love to hear it all. Okay, well, well, how about I start with just how we were raised? So like some of my earliest memories, I, I always could hear, especially my Aunt Lucy, always. Um, she she was a short little at the Baskin lady, but she was the most ardent one even when other aunts and uncles were telling her to hush she would be telling us kids hey the hairy man's out there and she would warn us there was one that lived near the gravel pit uh right at the end of the airport runway um and you know just various other things she would spit out well as a kid you, you know sometimes you when there's a lot of talk and you don't really notice anything it's just whatever well i was I thought I was a savvy kid, you know, because we were, we grew up hearing all the stories, you know, don't turn your back on the woods. Don't follow the whistle in the woods. Don't whistle in the woods. You don't talk about the hairy man. It'll bring it in. There's bad omen, you know, all this stuff. But when you're a kid and you don't have any life experience with that stuff, it's in one ear and out the other, you know, you're just like, yeah, talk. I'm going to go and work on my fort. But you know, it, I remember clearly it was 1983 when I, I took it for granted. And there, had, before I get ahead of myself, within small communities, there's usually a lot of, uh, especially up here, people that use a VHF radio like a telephone. And so our neighbors down the hill uh, towards the end of the runway, the Andersons and whatnot, uh, anytime there's anything kooky going on with bears coming up from Squaw Creek, uh, anything, just anything. Uh, they would VHF radio to everyone around so they would know, hey, be aware of a bear, a moose, hairy man, wh whatever it may be. But we would get, the well, my aunt would get these calls because we would be little tyrants out in the woods. You know, we're just a bunch of Indians whooping it up. But, you know, she would call us in. And, you know, so many times being called in without seeing anything, you kind of build a sense of they're full of it and they're just trying to, keep us away from having fun basically but it, it wasn't the case well we were told to stay close and i ignored it i waited till everyone was playing and i snuck away to go work on my tree for well i remember clearly hitting the open trail it, it, it wasn't as much brush I, I was surrounded by brush but it wasn't right up on me and it was a straight just a straight shot for about 70 yards and it hit a big batch of willows and in the on the other side of those willows off to the right was my little tree fort right and i'm on my way i'm kind of looking at my feet and all of a sudden just something gripped me i don't i don't know what it was i couldn't recognize it as a kid but it was my intuition my sixth sense going you're, you're being watched you know and so i stop and i look and i see a big tall dark shadow over in the willows but my uncle leo was six foot something uh, six foot four right so uh, real tall for a native, but he, he was, I thought it was him standing over in the brush and I thought, I, Oh, I'm, I'm in trouble. But I realized it's not him. Cause they're all, the reason all of us kids are here is everyone's out at the fishing grounds. So he wasn't even nowhere near, he was miles and miles away. So I'm kind of standing there looking and all of a sudden this thing screamed at me. And that's when the hairy man went from, Oh, this talk thing. And, and, and it became real. And it was just not even two months later, uh, we were on a, coming back from moose hunting camp. And this is on a fishing boat that we would use for base camp, a 32 foot boat. And we'd take the skiff and run up and down whatever, uh, the Nushigak River. And we were on our way back and got hung up on a gravel bar. But a hairy man started screaming at us from Black Bluff and throwing rocks. And so all his kids ended up down below deck and that's when I realized how dangerous they could be. Um, but again, as a kid, something screaming and throwing rocks from a distance, it's kind of, there's a separation there of distance. And, you know, once you're down in the hole hiding, 
you hear screams and then hear some gunshots and stuff, but it wasn't, uh, I, I guess to outsiders or people who haven't grown up in that kind of environment, it's like, holy crap, what are you talking about? There, there was something that doesn't exist supposedly up there th- chucking rocks at you guys. And you would think everyone in the villages would be running to the papers and running to anyone with a pair of ears to say, Hey, this is happening. But the reality is there's so much superstition. They don't like to talk about it. So, you know, there, there's all these dynamics to it, but anyway, uh, not, not trying to ramble on. I'm trying to give as much context and understanding to the actual environment, you know, cause if, if you're raised around racehorses, let's say you're going to know all about racehorses. It's just what it is. And this just happens to be remote Alaska. But so over the years since then, anytime we had seen something, it was always at a, a relatively safe distance, um, a couple encounters up close, but they were always moving away and making noise and we would get the hell out of there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We, no one in our culture, we're told not to follow them. Uh, you'd see tracks all the time. You just ignore them, go to the other way. You know, it's never been in our culture to be out squatching, you know, and it's, it's just not there. It's, uh, it's viewed as inviting a bad omen. You know what I mean? Inviting bad spirits to you. So anyway, um, outside of those encounters from a distance up until 2006, I would have told anyone who asked that, yeah, they live, they're real, just stay away from them they'll make noise they'll let you know they're there and you just leave you're good so in 2006 it was uh it was the day after my birthday september 13th in 2006 we left dillingham and the the reason i know that for sure is not just because of the trauma but my birthday was the day before and i i made sure it was all right with my elder that i was in civil some kind of civilization for my birthday Um, I had just turned 31. And so we leave the 13th and where we were going was up the Nuyakuk River. And that's up the Nushagak. It's the largest tributary by volume. And it, it runs from the wood tick chick. uh, It runs from tick chick Lake past Nuyakuk falls and the Nuyakuk river runs down to the uh, Nushagak river that circles back down over into basically Dillingham. And literally, you can go from the Tick Chick Lake all the way down to Aleknagik, which is a wood Tick Chick State Park. It's like a big loop, right? Uh, I'm just trying to explain the waterway. It's it's water everywhere up there, uh, rivers all over the place. Um, just Google Earth it. It's it's stunning. So anyway, it, it's way up there, 248 river miles, and. It took us a couple days. My elder was older. He was in his mid to upper 60s. Uh, he he wasn't like frail by any means. He was a subsistence hunter his whole life. It's just he moved slower. He was beat up from all the years of fishing, commercial salmon fishing and all that. Well, so he planned everything out. And me and my cousin, we were the worker bees. It was in our culture. Elder asked for help. You go help. Getting paid. What does that mean? You know, that's that's irrelevant you know, you're going to help, you know, so we all, we go up there, it was three of us, it took a few days traveling up the river and all that, but we, we get there September 17th, and it was about a couple hours before dark, and when we were in New Stuyahawk, we had stopped going up the river, and my elder visited with some, some of our extended family up that way, and one of the elders there, uh, put a bug in my ear about a, a big black bear, this, uh, reportedly other people had seen it on the berry patch and he asked me if you see this bear get it for me i want berry meat you know i want the black bear that's on the berry patch so with that in mind when we first got to this little it's a a a defunct fishing game counting tower so back in the days people used to literally climb up on a tower in this remote river and count fish one by one visually well, it had all been changed to LIDAR and some other stuff. And so this place had been basically abandoned for about a decade before we got there. And a couple hours before dark, I was thinking about that black bear, but it ended up working out. We didn't have time after unloading everything. And so <clears throat> my elder, while we were doing that, uh, 
he made us, uh, I, I think it was some kind of salmon chowder or something, but it was in a big soup pot on one of these Coleman stoves. And we get done eating. We're chilling. I was adjusting this uh, rear sight on my shotgun. I had just gotten the shotgun after fishing season. And, you know, it was an 870. 870 Remington, but it had the ghost ring sight in the back because it was uh, uh, a rifle. It was a slug gun for shotgun. I, I got it for a brush gun. And on the way up river, I had shot it a couple times and it was off a little bit. So I was, I was messing with that sight. And there was general conversation going on at the time about my elder, about where he wanted us to get samples for this gold mining trip because we were there to go sluicing for gold. Um, he had gotten all these basically portable type of things a high backer and all this other stuff you know and it took him a couple of years to acquire all this gear for what he wanted to do and he, of course he's like running things like a general at the moment you know just i want it from here and you know i want you know buckets from here and just dictating what he wanted done and it was a real light kind of mood it, there was no overall tension no one was drinking or whooping it up or anything and it was roughly they, they were playing cribbage or starting to play cribbage at that time when he was talking about where he read the samples and it, it had to have been at least a half hour after dark and I, i'm not talking just twilight i'm talking half hour after dark like dark and all of a sudden as i'm i'm playing with this site and just back and forth conversation here and there, the whole place creaks. It just, which was really odd because this place is only eight foot square. It's, it's not big at all. It's a glorified box on the back side of it is a 50 style trailer that the front of it was cut off and it was just kind of MacGyvered to the back side of this place uh, for sleeping quarters, just to have a bunk area for the fishing game observers when they used to work there. N not big at all. I mean, not big at all. And so when this whole place shifted with the size of it in mind, we would have known if it was windy. It was only five eighths plywood and two by four. It would have been obvious if the wind was blowing. It, you would hear it, but it was just dead quiet and the whole place just. Well, as I look over to like get confirmation, like that was weird, you know, someone else is in the room. I happened to notice movement over my cousin's shoulder between the top of his shoulder and the top of these little windows in this place on either side. When you come inside the door, that's when you're, when you're looking directly at the cabin, when you're up on the bank, the door is over to the left. And if you go inside this little eight foot square, there's a card table right there. There's two chairs. There's an 18 inch tall by 24 inch wide window here and directly mirroring it on the other side is another one little counter and immediately off to the floor on your right is this old drip stove an oil fueled stove and i mean nothing to it nothing to it so when i look at his when i look at him and i see that movement he sees the look on my face because I'm, I'm startled by it but he jumps up and says hey that ain't funny right and i say no no it, it, there was movement out there and it's next to a salmon river. So we assume it's a bear, right? Because, you know, it only makes sense. So we figured, okay, we'll run this bear off. And we grabbed this spotlight. Uh, it's million candle watt power, uh, six volt battery, just a big, ugly monstrosity. The batteries didn't last long, but we had a new battery in it. And it's a decent beam, you know. Uh, it's old school style, but it still worked really well. Anyway, so he had a 30 out six and I had that shotgun and we were just going to step out the door, find the bear, run it off or shoot it if it charged us. That was our game plan initially. And this door is only held to get, you know, held shut with this little J hook and an eyelet. And when we push open the door, we're standing there initially before we step out and I'm, I'm just using the light and just kind of sweeping right over towards the riverbank side looking for this bear we step out the door and i start moving the light and as i pan to the left looking over the tree line off to our left was about 50 yards and as soon as the light beam hit over there you just saw three sets of huge eye shine it was red um these these three hairy men standing there did not do anything they just stood there looking back at us 
typically before then, if you saw something like that in the woods, it would always try to hide. It would try to hide its face. But it's just the fact that they were there was enough to get us to go back inside. But they didn't care that they were seen is, you know, that 2020 hindsight thing. So as soon as we step back inside after seeing those three, I hooked that J hook and immediately it, it was like someone put earmuffs on us. Um, it was like this pressure in the room. And all of a sudden my cousin sounded like he was feet away and in a, like a talking to a, one of those little string phones, you know what I mean? With the cups, you know, where they sound far away, but they're right next to you. Real weird. So I'm saying you saw what I saw, right? You know, and I'm I'm looking across the way towards my elder and I'm saying, hey, there was some hairy man out there. I'd set down the beam and I was holding that shotgun offhand as we're talking. And as I'm talking to my elder, just trying, everyone's kind of slightly talking at once. But then all of a sudden, my cousin off my shoulder is under that card table. They were just playing cribbage at. And when, when I say he was under there, it was... It was faster than a snap. He was under that table. He had a death grip on that barrel of that 30 out six. And it looked like he was having a seizure, but in, in reality, he was freaking out and looking across the room. And, you know, initially we didn't pick up on that, but I'm looking at him trying to figure out what the hell. And he, he was in the process of wetting himself and it, everything was off. You, you got to understand when we came in the door, and just seeing those three out there, every everything was off. Everything went surreal. Um, so as I'm watching this unfold, I'm looking over at my elder and we're looking down at him trying to figure out what the hell. Because he's, yeah, I mean, when I say he, it looked like he was having a seizure, he was literally, his arms were locked up, his, his jaw was real tight, and he's looking across the room. And once we notice he's looking that direction, across the room towards that other window, uh, me and my elder, as we're looking at him, we look at each other and then turn and look. And roughly three feet away, uh, this thing was looking back at me in the, in the window. When I initially made eye contact with it, just before it looked at me, it was looking down at my cousin under the table. So immediately it's, it's like, what the hell? Um, the, the shock to the system, uh, the only way I can explain it is when every fiber of your being wants to run away, but it's stuck in your skin. It's like an electrical jolt. Um, and I, I was I was shocked. Now, Grant, it's taken far longer for me to explain this to you versus how it how it happened. But this thing, when it looked at me, it the middle of its brow furled down real low and, and just gave me this look of like your mind. Um, I immediately knew what food felt like. I, I felt like they were there to eat me. There was no mind speaker, none of that. It was, I, I felt it. It was the energy in the air. And so it moves slightly. Um, Grant, I was in a bit of a, a, a trauma tunnel or whatever, but it started moving and I instantly I shot through the wall. In my mind's eye, looking back, that was because I thought it was coming around to the door for some reason. I mean, this thing was humongous. Yeah, I only saw it from the bottom of the nose to the top of the brow in that 18 inch gap. This, this thing was very, very large. Um, I shoot through the wall three times uh, with that shotgun. It was just a thump, thump, thump that, that pressure when we came in the door was it, normally your ears would just be ringing like bad. It was a 12 gauge shotgun, right? Uh, but it was just a thump, thump, thump because of the pressure and the whole place shifted simultaneously with this scream, this thing let out. Uh, the scream was so loud. It reverberated in there. It rang that pot that we had this, this fish stew in like a tuning fork, like being, I mean, it was ringing. Play wow. shifted two feet, roughly. Uh, I almost fell down from that. I mean, it was quick. It, it was very violent, the, the motion. I thought it was going to throw us in the river. <laughs> so immediately, um, every everything's gone to a different level because of the gun going off, you know. Uh, my cousin still is not moved from the position he was in. He was identical to when, before I turned my head, 
my elder immediately ducks back into that little, as I call it, the little cubby area, that 50 style trailer and sits down on the, the one bunk there. And I, I was at a loss. Um, it, it was one of those moments of what, what the hell, what, what, what's really, what's really unfolding. Right. And so, uh, I, I put one of the chairs for what just, it, I was, uh, not in my right mind, but I took one of those little <laughs> chintzy plastic chairs and I put it up against the door. Like it was going to do anything. And I took the other one and I sat it with the back of it to this little cubby area so I could see both windows because this little entryway was dead center. And then I had roughly three and a half feet to either side to these windows. Wow. And I sat there. Um, I, I was shaking really hard. Uh, every once in a while, I'd have to pump that freaking Coleman lantern. I, I still... I still can't have a, a white light above me and the hiss of a lantern. I just, I can't, it's just too much. Um, you know, the only reason I stopped uh, shaking really hard and was able to even function was uh, basically resigning myself to being a dead. So it, it changed my mindset from uh, I'm, I'm going to die. And what do I do to, all right, they're going to get me, but what can I do to make it hard? You know, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to just give up, you know what I mean? So once I accepted that I was able to calm down. Um, but I literally sat there, uh, for hours, um, just envisioning the different ways I was going to get ripped apart. Uh, of course, you know, life regrets certain shit. Periodically, I was yelling at my cousin to, you know, get up and F and help me. You know, same with my elder. Uh, I was, there was points there where I wasn't nice with them um, because I felt all alone, you know, and, and I got two able-bodied people that I know, I know are subsistence hunters. I know they, they're out in the real shit. And, and all of a sudden I felt so alone. And so after, gosh, it had to have been more than a handful of hours. And I finally, uh, my cousin starts coming around because during that time, uh, there, there was things said by my elder, but it, it, it was a bunch of nonsense that had nothing to do with what was going on. And so I just, I, I leave that out of it uh, just because it, it, it has nothing to do with the encounter itself. It was just nervous energy um, trying to be redirected on a different topic. And I, I was like, no, no, I just shot this thing. You know, yeah. we got to do something. You know what I mean? But I was met with, uh, I guess, self-preservation for uh, his own mental state or whatever. But uh, I mean, so my cousin's coming around and I, I calm him down by telling him I shot it. It ran off. We're safe now. Uh, I got the gun away from him because when he initially fell down after I sh uh, before I shot and the place shifted, once I moved the chairs, I tried to grab the gun from him, the thirty out six, because it's a little more powerful. Mm -hmm. Um, but he had such a death grip on it and it was loaded. I did I didn't want to accidentally shoot him or whatever. But so we get him changing out. We get him more uh back with us. Cause his cheese was sliding off the cracker hard. He was babbling stuff. Uh, periodically he wouldn't make any sense. So once he was fully calmed down, which honestly, I couldn't tell you how long that took once he got up and fully calmed down and changed his clothes. Uh, I was asking him like, you saw what I saw, right? You saw the three sets of shine and he was nodding, you know, he was agreeing, but he wasn't really talking. And then I asked him, how come you fell under the table? And he said, I didn't want to. And I, I said, what happened? And he said, "My pers from where I was standing in the room, I couldn't see what he was seeing just by where I was. But from his vantage point, he was looking out and it was further back away from the window. And it showed its teeth at him. And when it showed its teeth, that's when he said everything was like, he lost it and was under the table. 
And he said when he fell under the table, this thing came in closer. And then a second later, we turn and meet eyes. So, yeah, it, it was. You, you got to understand when he was telling me this, it, tears were running like a faucet, uh, you know, snot bubbles and all. It, it was a bad, bad scene. Um, and so everything was quiet after I shot and the scream happened and I sat there, it was dead quiet, not a peep. I mean, when a moth would hit the window, I, there, there was, I can't even count the times I almost just lit the place up with that gun, just shooting through the walls or windows or whatever. Um, so anyway, once he calmed down and we, we started talking about getting out of there and we were tethered. I mean, we, we sunk an acre, like, gosh, it, it had to have been at least at minimum 50 feet from the shore back on the tundra because this particular skip we used was a 22 foot flat bottom and it was used, uh, commercial salmon fishing as well. So it had a long anchor line for the tides, right? So it could be anchored up no matter what the tide was. And so anyway, that's what we had tethered back. And so we're, we're going over all these things, right? Planning our escape. And as, as we're doing so, my cousin brings up, let's grab the light, the spotlight, and let's see if they're out there. Let's see what we can see and, you know, take it from there or whatever so you know i agreed and what we had to do was kill that coleman lantern because we're getting that mirrored effect it was bad enough with the spotlight but with the with the uh coleman above our heads it was even worse but so we kill that and we're we're beaming out the riverbank side first and there's nothing um how long we actually looked with the light uh it's it's kind of hard to say that that part's a little blurry just by time and terror but we looked, you know what I mean? We were making sure that there wasn't anything on that side. And then we went to the side on the riverbank side, you know, inland side from river uh, to look where the three sets of eye shine were. And we beamed out that direction first and we're, we're looking for the eye shine. There's nothing. We don't see anything. And as we pan back off the back side of this place, uh, away from the river side, there's this outhouse there that was built long time ago. <clears throat> and again, everything was built with minimal cuts. So it was a very odd shaped outhouse, single sided roof, but it was eight, eight and a half feet tall and it hadn't been used in forever, but it was sitting there. And as we pan back to that point, this huge black silhouette was behind it. Um, it wasn't right up on it. It was back from it just a little ways, but this thing was hulking. I, I mean, it was at least 13, 14 feet tall, every bit of five, five and a half foot wide, right? Hulking, big. But what was scarier than its size is it was absorbing the light. It No eye shine back. Uh, it was like a the darkest shadow you ever seen, just absorbing light. Um. I mean, that it, it felt in that moment, it felt like that big black nothingness was there for us. And I can't even quantify that in the words, um, how disheartening it felt to, to see that. And as soon as this thing twitched and started moving just the slightest bit, we, we killed that light and we were tucked back in a little cubby and we had barrels crossed, um, it was pitch black. You can hear the barrels clanking against each other. It, it was all bad. Um, nice. we're, we're mumbling, shaking, but it's dead quiet. We don't, there's no motion on the ground. There's no shaking or vibrations. This is dead, dead quiet. And we sat there. Um, after some time, we, it, with it being quiet and calm, we calmed down and we started getting our plan together again you know yeah I, i've shared this experience many many times um 
there there's something about that that big black nothingness um that that was far scarier than it staring me in the eyes uh me having to shoot through the wall any of it that was the single most terrifying thing out of all of it i mean what absorbs light like what what yeah. does that like you, you know what i mean like yeah. anyway just one of those things with it being quiet, we get our game plan back on in track. You know, we're, we're talking about what we're going to do. No one's bringing shit. I mean, we're bringing our, our important stuff, our wallets and stuff like that. And ammo, anything other than that, you know, it's, it's right here. We, we ain't taking it with. So uh, exactly how much time went by. I don't know. I do know that we were standing up again, had uh, the lantern on again uh briefly and then something was going on with my elder um he ended up what ended up happening was he took that lantern into the back and shut it off and we start talking again now some of these little nitnoid things uh sometimes i share them sometimes i don't it, it's however it's hitting me in the moment but when we we're tucked back in this cubby again after because with the lantern being on and it, him grabbing it and going in the back was really the briefest of moments right um as we were talking and discussing what we were going to do and we we left the lantern thing alone because he was our elder and because we wanted light to see our ammo you know make sure we have our pockets full of stuff or whatever uh, we didn't argue with them in that moment as far as getting the light. We figured we'll, we'll get back to that, that no big deal or whatever. But in the near distance during this period of time, it, it sounded like rotor wash from a helicopter, this thump, 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 thump sound, right? And we started feeling it in the ground. Um, and all of a sudden you could feel this thing. It ran by this, the same, uh, on the riverbank side, the same side that I shot through the wall on. And so once this thing runs by, we're immediately quiet and, you know, barrels crossed again kind of thing. It was like almost instantaneous once it passed by that window, because you could feel it in the ground and, and hear it. Uh, the rest of them were standing around this place and started running around it. And you could feel the different sizes of them um it, it it was the most odd thing to try to express because you could feel the weight some of them are smaller and some of them were bigger mm -hmm. and you could just tell by when they would be going by uh they would run around a little bit and they would back off a little ways then they would do it again and in 2020 hindsight i think they were trying to see if we were going to shoot again because when the one was there and looked at me in the window, I shot, yeah. you know, so kind of trying to reason it out. It makes sense that they were running by to see if I was going to continue shooting or not. Right. Um, but it was just the oddest thing. It was like the second time they had backed off and then started running around again. You could hear one of them sniffing the outside of that little travel trailer. I mean, even to this day, I love my dogs, but you know how dogs would get up by your ear and do that sniffing thing? Yes. I can't hang with that. I, I can't. It, it's it's a serious trigger. Um, so that goes on, and then they back off, and it goes quiet again. I mean, dead quiet. And it during that time, I was on the verge of losing it, right? Um, but my my cousin we had been kicking around this 16 penny nail all day ever since we got there. Not literally all day, but the whole time we were there, there's this annoying little bent 16 penny nail from God only knows when. And my cousin started saying, let's nail the door shut. And I, I got blessed. him. I, I get it. But I, I was like, stay with me. Um, we need real plans. Cause that nail ain't stopping nothing, you know? So, you know, we go through that little spat and 
um, portions that I leave out is the emotional outlashing, uh, lashing out at each other um, in those moments of, of extreme fear, you know, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't like talking about that part, but, uh, I feel people need to understand when people are in that high of a stress of a situation, um, you know, things are little petty arguments start over the simplest stuff. But anyway, so we had that dynamic going on. And so with the being quiet and stuff after that running around, um, cooler heads prevailed of course we get back on our game plan and it was to make it to the skiff cut that line because we're tethered and he would jump in fire up the skiff as i helped our elder down the embankment because we were on the high bank and it's it was a bit of a cut bank and you had the the grass and stuff hanging over the lip of a six seven foot high little river bank and it it was fairly steep trail going up it but once you got to the top it was just a straight little 20 foot path to the little shack there we're discussing all this stuff right and as we're discussing it that's when the lamp comes back on we're we're, we're gathering up all the ammo we're we're discussing what we're going to do i hand him my pocket knife and i'm like we got to you got to cut that bow line when you jump down and I'll help, you know, I'll help the elder and you start the skiff. So we get all that dynamic down. And um, that period of time is a little bit fuzzy mm -hmm. um, just be because of how things were so, uh, it was like a hurry up and stop a hurry up and wait kind of anxiety, which it, it wasn't doing any of us any good, but that time of year we're on like a 12, 12 light cycle and the sky is just changing like twilight, like, right. Uh, once we were fully got our game plan going about what we're going to do. And just as we are, getting up by that door and getting our nerve to execute our getaway plan. Um, it sounded like a pellet gun starts hitting the wall and it's the wall. We're about to go out of the door side and there's no windows. It's just that chintzy door. And again, you got to understand all this is unfolding in an eight foot square, a, a, a whole lot of nothing. Right. <laughs> and so it sounds like a pellet gun. It's like a thack that sound and it was a slow cadence at first and then it was just it, it like transitioned into a hailstorm like real fast and again boom we're right back in that cubby right back to barrels crossed uh lamps dead you know we killed that um you know it had it had ran its course with fuel it it, it, it just everything was all bad um there was no our, our togetherness wasn't there in those moments, which is shameful on all of us. But, you know, with the extreme stuff going on, it it, it was when I started really feeling messed with. Like, it, it seemed like every time we had a, an escape plan uh, and we had, you know, conjured up the bravado to try to make it happen, something else terrifying would happen. It, it was like they were feeding on our fear, you know, uh, that's speculation, but that's how it felt. It felt like we we're being toyed with. And so we sat there. Um, I'd like to say about 45 minutes to an hour, but again, it was, it was, I mean, just everything was so messed up. It, it's hard to say it was 45 minutes exactly. Right. But once things were quiet and we were, we were quiet finally, um, it was getting light enough to where we could see that tree line without a flashlight. Right. So it was plenty light enough. We look outside again, nothing, nothing. And that's when we're like, okay, we're going to go. So we line up, I'm behind my cousin and he's got my shotgun at this point. And I got the 30 out six elder behind me. Um, I have my elders 12 gauge shotgun, which is an old wingmaster, And we swapped out the bird shot for slugs, uh, 
man, that shotgun is such a monstrosity. But anyway, I have this big old shotgun over my shoulder. We go out the door and man, it is fast. It, it was like we practiced it our whole life and never did it together at all, you know. But we hit the riverbank and my cousin's down there like right now. I'm helping my elder from behind me come around. And again, it's a cut bank. There was dew on the grass. It was real slippery there. So I'm I'm literally leaning down, helping him get his footing. And where I'd set the 12, uh, the 30 out six down next to me, I still had that shotgun over my shoulder. And so it was kind of pushing me forward at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, the butt of it was hitting the yeah. ground and kind of forcing me forward. Right. So I scooted back like four to six inches, uh, just a little bit to get the butt of the gun, you know, free from pushing me forward. And I grabbed the 30 out six and I stood up. Well, when I got to full height, I mean, literally just inches from my nose, this rock a little bigger than a basketball just, just flies by my face. Uh, very, very fast. Um, immediately everything goes slow motion. My eyes lock on it. And this rock, uh, impacted about three feet of river water, fast moving river water and impacted the bottom. And you heard it crack, uh, before the water could close over the top of the impact. Uh, it, it was thrown hard. Um, and that had to have been in the air by the time I stood up because it, I'm, when I turned, looked that direction, that big black nothingness was coming out of the trees. Um, I assumed it was coming from that direction. And so, I mean, there's only so many options in that situation of where it could have came from. And so I assumed it was that, that pitch black nothing that threw it so i i swung and i put three shots from that 30 out six on it um you know uh, a 30 out six is a very powerful gun um up until that day i would have trusted a 30 out six for any animal up here in alaska uh we killed walrus with it brown bear moose uh, every everything except a polar bear i've used a 30 out six to put down with no problem. So when I shoot this thing three times center mass, uh, it, it didn't have eye shine. I could, you couldn't make out anything other than this big black mass. But when I shot it, I heard the rounds impact. Um, you know, for something to get shot like that and, and it just stopped moving forward. It didn't buckle. There was no noises other than the impact sounds of the rounds. But uh, for something that big to just not even be phased by thirty out six, that that that's that's scary as hell too. But so it stopped moving forward, and immediately, you know, it's like go time. I I jumped down the bank. Uh, my shotgun was on the ground for some reason in front of the skiff, and the line wasn't cut. And at this point, when I jumped down, I all this is taking way longer to explain than how it went down. Cause literally as soon as I let go of my elder's arm and he was good and I'm standing up, he was just getting ready to sit down on, on the skiff and get in. Right. When I, cause I was looking down at him and then all of a sudden the rock flew by. Right. Yeah. So I'm down there. I'm, I'm yelling for the knife. The outboard is running. Thankfully. And I'm like, throw me the knife, throw me the knife. And so he throws the knife and I cut the, I cut that line. Cause there's like 12 feet of chain and then there's regular rope. I cut the rope and I had just set the 30 out six into the bow when I, when I got the knife and whatnot. And I'm, I cut the line and I'm putting the chain in and I noticed my elders still got his butt on the edge and he's doing the swing the legs thing in. And I shoved him. I, I mean, I shoved him pretty hard. He had a really bad bruised wrist after that. But anyway, I shoved him in and my cousin's trying to shift the gear and it's idling too high. And I'm yelling at him, Hey, idle down, idle down. And as just as he gets it shifted and I got the last bit of that line in there, uh, I didn't have a chance to grab my shotgun. We left that too, but their eyes get big. Cause as soon as I shoved my elder in, as soon as he hit the bottom of the, uh, bottom of the skiff he turned around and faced back my direction you know facing the front of the skiff and my cousin was already facing that direction but both of them 
were their eyes got huge looking at the riverbank up behind me. And as I'm as I'm pushing off and, and looking back, I see up to about the shin or so of this one that was standing there, uh, kind of like, I mean, menacingly over us, you know. Uh, when I look back, it had really, really dark hair, but the the ends of it, the tips, were like a, almost like an auburn red, like a mm-hmm. orangutanish kind of color to them. You know what I mean? And it reminded me of a rose hair tarantula under a black light because they're they're so dark, but then they got those lighter hairs or whatever. Mm-hmm. But anyway, when I look back, that's what I saw as I pushed off, and he had it in reverse. And we back up, and as he's backing up, when I came in. Uh, I let that old shotgun slough off my shoulder and I grabbed that 30 out six and I'm, I'm trying to put rounds in it. Right. Well, he had shifted it forward and my tunnel vision at this time, I could easily look through, you know, a peephole of a door. No problem. I mean, I was, wow. it, it was all just closing in on me, you know? So I'm, I'm getting these rounds and I'm looking for uh, the 220 grain rounds that I knew we had. Um, it, it's a bit chaotic, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I noticed we're, we're, we're weaving back and forth, and I thought he was just trying to break friction to get up on step, right? And I didn't find this out until many years later, about 15 years later. The reason we were swaying back and forth is once he put it in forward and we we cleared the initial landing area where we were, these things were chucking rocks at the skiff, trying to hit the outboard. Um, but luckily, all they did was they dented the transom and cracked the cowling a little bit. But that was something I didn't learn until many years later. And uh, <clears throat> once we got got away, so to speak, um, once once we cleared the Nuyakuk and got onto the Nushigak River proper, um, I, I felt like I weighed a ton, man. I felt like it was like everything hit me at once. You know, all the adrenaline was gone. The night of just tense gripping that gun, you know, um, because you got to understand, I was gripping that shotgun initially so hard. My hands hurt. I I had a death grip on it. Um, It was, you know, in that moment when I'd have to pump the lamp when I was still sitting there before I accepted that I was going to die. It was so hard. I was so scared to let go of the handle of this gun, even though I'm still holding it with the other hand and pump this thing because I didn't want to be in the dark. You know, it it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was a bad night for sure. Um, But again, up, up until that day, I would have been like, uh, they make noise. You leave them alone. They go on about their way. Yeah. But that really changed my point of view. Um, as far as the, the, what they're, what they can really be about, you know? Um, and again, it's 2020 hindsight, but we were, it was an attempted ambush. We were lured out and had we taken a couple more steps, had we not seen that eye shine, we would have walked right around that corner. Cause that's, that's where the path went by that, that side going back towards the outhouse. That's where naturally we're going to see if it's following the trail to scare the bear. Right. But uh, had we not seen that eye shine, we would have walked right into the one around the corner. It was, uh, yeah. you know, there's there's an aspect to it, too, because like for four years after that, um, I was self-medicating, drinking heavy. It was it was the weirdest thing. It was like I had this form of shame. And. Uh, like we all survived, but it was almost like a like a survivor guilt, almost like, you know, uh, a lot of self blame, like what'd you do? Yeah. All all sorts, you know, the, the stuff that goes through your mind after something like that, it's really traumatizing. And that's why when I talk to people, when I do their, uh, when I share their encounters on the channel, I, I I put myself in their shoes because a lot of them, their shoes weren't as extreme as mine in that point. So it's easy for me to relate that, that angst, that fear, yeah. that, you know, what the, what the hell moment, you know what I mean? And so, you know, I, 
my form of therapy for it is doing what I do on the channel and, you know, sharing that encounter sometimes are easier than others. Um, you know, it just depends on the day. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you, you, for all those people out there going to look to find something, you got to be careful what you're looking for. Cause what are you going to do when you find it? And it may not want to play nice with you, you know? Right. Right. Um, it, it may find you first. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's that part of it too. Yeah. But again, you know, some of these, uh, most of these encounters are so random. Um, I talk to people all the time. They've been hunting the same spot for almost a half a century, you know, 45 plus years and one 20 minute experience. They ain't been in the woods since, you know, yes. all it takes is that one, that one 20 minute encounter and it could, it could change things for you forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I went back out the next year immediately, like, well, within reason, um, to get back out in the woods. Cause I knew if I didn't get back out, I would never go again. Uh, so it happens I was with two other cousins and we had an encounter that day, but it, they were closing in around us and we left. It was, there was no, um, outward visual it was just hearing them with the owl hoots and stuff real creepy stuff mm -hmm. but it was no doubting what they were but you know that it it really i i used to have a passion for what's over the next hill i still do but it's um it's very reserved i'll internally get excited about it but then uh, it, it's like, ooh, you know, it, it, it killed the joy of the woods for me. Yes. I still go, I still love the scenery and stuff, but I'm never comfortable in the woods anymore. I haven't been in, in forever. Yeah. Um, I, I can, you know, kick back and put on a, a, a happy face and just relax. But internally it's like, what's Yeah. You can't ever, you can't ever view the forest the way you did before. There's no way. No, no, not at all. Um, but I mean, it is what it is. I, it's in my blood to be out in the woods, so I can't just not do it, you know? So I just kind of, and that's another reason for the channel. The, the more you hear other people's encounters, it's not to scare you. It's to, Hey, okay, wait, I hear a weird owl who wait, squirrels don't quite sound like that. You know, you know what I mean? Like, yes just and they've been known to mimic babies crying yes uh other people's voices and i mean to a t yes. that's that's creepy stuff it's terrifying um, it's yeah. terrifying that what they can do like a baby like you said a baby crying or a cat or a dog or uh other people's voices it's terrifying and it's their intelligence i think is kind of terrifying that they know us they know us so well and i I, I mean, I just think humans are such easy targets. Yeah, I, I, for the most part, you know. Um, but then, you you know, I, I can't say that experience is like that for everyone because it's just not. I mean, for the vast majority of people who have encounters, these things show themselves and people get the hell out of there. You, you know what I mean? There, there's been a few where they kind of stuck close and kind of watched the people leave. Um, but there's never been that, Hey, we're good friends kind of, kind of thing. Really? I, I still have some encounters to share and some people have had, uh, far less aggressive experiences, but, uh, even, uh, Dan, when he was rescued by a female up on a, on the Golcana river many years ago, um, I asked him, I was like, wow, you know, that that's the first time I heard of one of these things being helpful. I said, what was your impression? What was the energy like? What'd you feel? And he said, I felt like I was a nuisance and they were trying to get rid of me because there was trooper helicopters and planes and, you know, they were actively searching for a lost kid, you know? So he said he felt that they were annoyed by his presence and, and got rid of him, basically put him in a place where he'd be found. Right. And yeah. I was like, okay, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. I mean, it's still a, a regardless of the intention it's a good gesture you know yes. they they could have just killed him and you know i mean yeah. you know there's always that but 
I think you made such a good point on uh, one of the shows I was watching that you were on, and, and you were talking about how we warn people about bears, like we educate people about bears, you know, and it's Yes. just so, it's so, I, I love the fact that you're trying to help and educate and warn people about, you know, not all of these are warm, fuzzy, tree-hugging kind of experiences. I love that about what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, because at the end of the day, it's about public safety. I mean, had had I known more at the time, um, and again, I don't, I don't knock my culture. I, it, it's there for a reason. You know, their their superstition is there for a reason. Um, it started somewhere for some reason, right? So I can't, I can't knock it, but I, I feel we're getting to a point to where, uh, with people not sharing all the information they know, uh, we're working against ourselves because we, they may have an experience that holds uh, a puzzle piece that makes something else look a little more clear and just have a better understanding of what we're working around out in the woods Absolutely. you know Absolutely. um because the only places i don't get reports from no one lives there <laughs> so there's no one to report anything so i mean i literally hear from people all around the state you know my cousin my elder cousin she had an experience down on the aleutian islands you know down outside of dutch harbor on, on alaska um mimicking a baby crying to lure them out And not only a baby, a known baby, like they knew this baby cried. It was familiar to everybody. Just that kind of stuff is just, gosh, the cunning, the, the cunning behind it is, is unreal. That's It's terrifying. unreal. The, That's absolutely yeah. terrifying. Yeah. Oof. You know, So what, what, what are these things? <laughs> The million yeah, dollar in question. my head, yeah, I, I mean, I wish I had the answer, but what makes sense for me is, you know, I hear a lot of people say, oh, it's the Nephilim and this, and that. I don't think it's that. Um, I think they're part of the corrupted flesh when the Nephilim corrupted the, the 200 species back before the flood. And I mean, it, it's what makes sense to me, you know, because of the DNA study, they have a, a human female and an unknown father. Well, Yes. you know, It, it that's what makes sense to me. I'm not saying I'm right, but it's, I haven't seen them disappear and reappear. Um, I've seen them so well camouflaged. If they didn't move, you'd walk right past them, you know, cause they blend in that well. Um, I don't know if that's due to the hollow hair and they can reflect the light around them and blend in better. Who knows? Um, Again, this is all speculation because there are no experts, none. I, I totally Um, agree. there's some there's some good researchers with some very good ideas and theories, but no one has one in the garage that they're gain, you know, garnering information from. So but yeah, um and that's what drives me forward is just trying to get people to see, hey, uh, this oral history is here for a reason. You know, Cambridge has only been there since 1692. You know what I mean? I'm going to I'm going to go by what my elders taught me, because that goes back a millennia, you know, or more. So, Yes. yeah, it, it's. There's a lot of people out of curiosity, they want that encounter, and I get it. I mean, human curiosity is a wonderful thing. However, you really do. You, you got to. Don't underestimate what you're chasing. you don't, you don't want to do that. Yeah. You know, uh, any good hunter will tell you if you're tracking a bear, it ain't very long before you're being tracked by that bear. They have a, a, a keen sense of awareness and they did a study. They had wolves collared up here, right? Uh, outside of Denali national park that two separate packs that were both collared and one pack was, over 60 miles away the dominant pack in the area was 60 miles away from their border the very moment and they they documented this with tracking collars the moment that other rival pack crossed their border immediately shows within moments that pack returning back towards their border they sensed someone entered their domain 60 miles away that's wolves you know what i mean 
And wow. I, they're very cunning animals. But let's try to extrapolate that to a very intelligent hominid of some kind. What are they aware of that we lost over time? You know, hanging out in the city and all that kind of crap. You know, it just, it kind of makes you wonder, you know, what are they capable of? And personally, I, I, I don't, I don't know if we'll ever know, honestly. I mean, yeah, I, I, I feel we may be at a tipping point with all this UFO disclosure, right? Yes. Uh, they're putting it out in a way where they're playing dumb with it. Oh, well, this happened and we, we don't know nothing about it, you know, but it is there and it's true. I, I think it's just a matter of time before they play dumb with this as well. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the things that may be causing them to not be so forthright and, and make reports more known is the liability issue um, just here in Alaska, what, 500 to 2,000 people every year go missing. missing. And again, they're not all hairy man related, but you got cases like Mary Wilson, <laughs> you know, and um, a hunter from out of state, I think it was from Tennessee or Kentucky. He was up at Coldfoot hunting caribou and he walked in open tundra and stuff to go and get his pack. Uh, less than a mile away or something like that during broad daylight poof gone just mm -hmm. gone no sign uh you know there's a rumor the troopers weren't allowing tracking dogs that that's not true the dogs weren't tracking anything the mm -hmm. dogs were not working they they would just lay down or stay in their kennel um then you got mary wilson she gone without a trace on the stampede trail uh, her truck was found at mile 6.9. Her grandson was in the back seat, a two-year-old, uh, a little dehydrated, but safe. Now, they found personal belongings of hers a mile further up trail, and no sign of her, none. What would cause a woman, grandchild, to be left in the back seat and her go the wrong direction for help? You know what I mean? It, there, yeah. There's this, and there's a million cases like that out there. The hardest thing about trying to find real information is, is they will put out a missing person bulletin. And on that bulletin, it's just who it is, last place they were seen, last thing they were wearing, the last known location. That's it. You get no backstory. There's no context to it, really. And because they have that default of, we can't give you any information. It's an open investigation. Right. It, you're not going to get any real information. It, yeah. It's just, I trust me. I tried. Uh, I was told get a freedom of information act for simple 911 calls uh, to all sorts of stuff that it was just like, you have to be really committed to finding this information or spending money on this that you may end up not getting anyway you, you know what i mean it, yes. it's like what's it really worth to you to invest all that time and energy and funds into it if you're just gonna sit there and get pulled pound sand it, it's right. it's not no it's very yeah, clear it's they don't gonna... they don't want you to they don't want us to know and they don't want us sticking our nose in it either it's very clear but i think you're right yeah. about the whole yeah. liability yeah. if they if they have to admit that they knew about these things all along and didn't warn people. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it could be a very, very ugly situation. I mean, very, very the class ugly. action lawsuits alone, it, it would, yeah, it would be, it'd be a crippling mess. Um, yeah, I, it, it, I try not to let my mind go that direction because it's just so aggravating. <laughs> it's just not worth my time right now. Yeah. Because I know it's not going anywhere. Yeah. You know, I, I've shared experiences from several different law enforcement officials anonymously. They could be Jim, Paul, Greg, whoever <laughs> in the share I, I share. But it, it's just to help them not get doxxed or lose their pension or anything sure. like that. But I really the only the only one that was forthright was a federal investigator, Robert Johnson, Um uh, that video is unknown fear in Denali. So this guy, he motorcycle trip on vacation. He was, he wasn't on business. Uh, he 
drove his motorbike up here in like a week from Idaho or something. And he was with his son up in Fairbanks riding around because his son was in the military and he damaged his bike somehow. And he went into Fairbanks and was like, Hey, what's it going to cost to ship this to Anchorage? And in Fairbanks, they said, well, shipping it from here to Anchorage is going to cost just as much as it's going to cost you to ship from Anchorage to Seattle. So he's like, screw that. I'll drive it, you know, screw it. So he he's coming back from this little vacation on his motorbike, nursing it along. And he gets to Healy, Alaska, which is, you know, uh, basically the hub for Denali, you know, all the tour buses go there. You got the princess lodge and all that. So there's this little lodge called the white moose lodge just on the outskirts of town. And behind this lodge, it's just mountains. Uh, it's nothing but beautiful, gorgeous mountains. But anyway, so this guy, federal investigator, uh, been to this as his words were I've been to sandbox several times anti-terror da, da, da. he he listed off all these accolades of you know the missions he had been on and stuff well something started banging on the back of that lodge he said he felt like a scared five-year-old boy with whatever was hitting that place was hitting it so hard uh, he knew it wasn't mechanical he could tell it was organic but he said it scared him like primal, that primal fear. And he didn't see anything. All I heard was a banging. Uh, what do you do with that? You know, you can't really, you report that to management, of course, but everyone in the place, there wasn't a whole lot of people staying there at the time, but everyone was out in the little gravel parking lot looking at the building and they, no one was volunteering to go around there to take a look either, you know? Yeah. Just oof. But, what friend of mine or friend of yours do you know of that even without seeing them instills fear that that's not a friend in my opinion just yeah. just saying yeah just an observation and uh, it's a it's yeah. a crazy kind of fear too it's not it's not like any fear that you've ever experienced before it's it's like you said it's yeah. that primal fear that that fear that kind of locks you down where you just absolutely cannot mm -hmm. move like you can't move. You're just yeah. frozen. It's uh, yeah. You either freeze up or it's that flight and you would beat yeah. Carl Lewis on a track meet. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like um, it's, it's one of those things, you know, and everyone reacts to it differently. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I hear people all the time. Oh, I'd love to see one in this and that. And yeah. it's like, I get it, but you really, you really don't. Yeah. Cause just cause you want it a certain way like the paddy footage, you know, gently walking away, nice open area. You're not necessarily in real danger in the moment versus reality of it is, is you don't have a choice of where you meet up with it. It's yeah. not your decision whether or not it's going to be aggressive, you know? No. And I've talked to many people who had a gun in their hand and had, and once they saw how big it was, yeah, they didn't, they, they wanted nothing to do with shooting at it. And, and I get that, you know, yeah. um, yeah, it's definitely, I wish there was more answers. You know Me what too. I mean? Me too. Um, I do too. I guess, we're, I guess we're kind of hoping that some of the people that we talk to will have pieces of that puzzle. Right. No, fair enough. Fair enough. And with the map, I'm actually, um, we haven't had a chance to do it yet, but with all the data we're compiling, we're going to take time of year mm -hmm. uh time of day uh type of aggression whether it be breaking a tree throwing a rock on up you know and just see if there's a pattern to it whether it be an odd year uh even year uh we know a lot more occurrences happen in the fall but just get that data down on paper and see if there's enough compelling you know anecdotal evidence to maybe go okay this time of year over in this area we'll have a better chance of you know coming across something and maybe getting some answers but yeah again that's that's still a work in progress so we'll see how that works out yeah so do you think it's going to be one of those um you have to have a body to prove they and I, I know that I, I know you know they exist so there's no i mean do you have a do you wish there was a body that they would bring in a body and, and prove it or? Uh, yeah, actually I, I do. And 
I, I tell people, you know, that jokingly say, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get a body and, and drag it downtown. Well, you would have to. You would have to take it to City Hall and <laughs> film an autopsy on the spot. Multiple people there on Facebook yeah. Live, <laughs> everyone recording this, because if you just go with the body, no, no one is going to hear anything about that body. You know what I mean? You literally yes. would have to put it in everyone's face and have them come touch it, smell it, look at it oh. right now yeah. and, and right. get organic, you know, just let it spread that way. Cause yeah. uh, any other way, I, I don't see it working. No. I, and I, um, there was a man in Ohio that I worked with that he was on his way to work and uh, an electrical engineer, I think. And he was on a highway, like a really, a really big highway. And he came up on this scene he said it looked like a 50 gallon drum of blood was in the middle of the road. Mm. And he looked, and he was driving, uh, he just kind of felt like it was an 18 wheeler that hit this thing. And he, he looked off to the side of the road on the shoulder and it was laying there still like he saw it and it was, uh, it was decapitated. So that's why he thinks Ooh. it was an 18 wheeler that hit it. It was decapitated. And I think one of its arms was missing, but he saw the body and he happened to be on the phone with his wife, who was a nurse. And he told her what mile marker, you know, to go, because she was going to be, uh, I think, leaving for work at six that morning. So he told her what mile marker to, you know, that all of this was had happened at and he had to go off on to work. And so she she called him after she went past there she goes there's there's nothing at that mile marker she said there's not there's absolutely nothing and he just couldn't believe he said you you must have gone to the wrong place he said there was so much blood and and that's that's one thing he said and i and i'd heard this before from a witness about the blood volume of these things and um so he went there after he got off work and he said and sure enough he said they had sanitized the entire area he said they must have gotten one of those steam like have you seen those machines that are like a it's like a street cleaner but it's a, a it shoots steam and then it vacuums it back up he said that must have been what they did yeah. they totally sanitized the whole area and he looked in the paper and waited and waited of course you know no one ever said a darn thing about it but he knows what he saw yeah yeah it's it there's so many stories out there like that as well and grant you some people want their their moment to shine and they you know tell a wild story or whatever but there's i mean i've talked to so many people that want nothing to do with attention you, yes. you know what i mean they would yes. rather they're just like what the hell you know like what what's really going on here yeah. and so many researchers they they start out because they had an experience you, you know what i mean i i, I, I Honestly, I haven't met one that didn't have something odd happen that sparked their curiosity because most people who have an encounter, they're they're 10 times more likely to jump down that rabbit hole just looking for answers. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, I never really wanted answers per se because I grew up with the knowledge of them. So I've always known they were out there. Uh, my biggest thing now is what's that switch between them just shaking a tree to you being dinner? You know what I mean? What's, yes. you know, it, it's weird. It's like they won't cross a threshold. The door has to be open. Um, just just certain things, you know, they, they could easily crush that shack. I mean, easily. They probably outweighed it in material you, you know what i mean all the material in that that trailer and stuff they probably outweighed it yeah. um so what's what's that that separation what's that i don't know unanswered questions you know they, yes. they drive you forward so yes i mean it, is know. there is there a code of conduct that they have that they right they, some yeah. unwritten law like the black eyed kids they got to be invited in that kind of thing yes. um what what is it you know that there, it's got to obviously be something for and you know gosh for so many people they feel like they were uh like they're feeding off the negative energy mm -hmm. during their encounter because they would have them dead to rights but they were more interested it seemed like in scaring them versus yeah like putting hands on them so to speak you know which makes you wonder why 
or were they trying to get the adrenaline rush? Do do we taste better when we're adrenalized? Who knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's adrenochrome. What what's the, you know, what's the what's that that switch that changes it? You know. Yeah, you know that's a very good point, and I had not thought about that. I mean, the, the adrenochrome is obviously a real thing. Yeah, I hadn't thought so about that. So it, it it's pure speculation, of course, but I, I try to look at things and and try to make sense of it. You know, because some some of these random encounters or any encounter, really, it doesn't make sense from the standpoint of what we're brought up to think in the mainstream. Yeah. You know, you got all this stuff that mocks it, but then the reality of it is totally different, you know? Yeah. And and, and I think that's the media's job. Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just mislead everybody. Yes. Uh, and- that false sense of security as well. And that's it. And, you know, I, I made the joke one time that you'd be happy to be in a cardboard box just for some form of separation, which is, is very true. You know, we're, we have such powerful minds that a nylon tent, you could feel like, <laughs> oh, I'm safe in here. And you're just in a, a to go bag. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, they could just <laughs> exactly. grab that whole thing and you're, you're just lunch. Yeah. I I had that, I had that realization one time in in a real high elevation in a tent and we had had some vocalizations that night that were just, and I recorded them and it it was fantastic. But then when everything went quiet and I mean that time, you know, what kind of quiet I'm talking about, my knees were shaking. I mean, and we were, we were in such an isolated area and it was just, you know, uh, my boyfriend at the time and myself and that night we crawled into, you know, a nice cabin, I mean, a nice uh, canvas tent. And my my uh, cot was next to the wall and he was right here. And he had a 44 Magnum, like right underneath. But right. at some point there was, you know, like when something wakes you up out of a dead sleep and you're, you know, and you know, you just heard something right out, you know, just right there, right on the other side of that canvas. And it is pitch black and your heart is like feels like it's about to break your ribs it's beating so fast and in that in that second I realized you know what a dumb ass you are to think that that 44 magnum if this thing rips through that canvas right now you're going to be you're going to be a hundred yards away from here before he can even pick that gun up Right. And is he yeah. going sh- and- to shoot in the blackness? I mean, it, it's just like you said, it's a false sense of security. But at some point, you know, you wake up and you're like, if that thing is going to, if that thing's going to kill me, it's, there's nothing I can do. You're absolutely powerless. Right. Right. And, you know, a lot of times in the comment section, you know, when a, it may be an encounter I share where there's shots fired, you know, I have people legitimately upset in the comments saying, well, if you didn't fire on them, it wasn't doing nothing. Well, that's so easy to say, but you weren't Joe Schmo standing on the trail with this thing feet away and it had been stalking you. It right. had been pacing you and now it's chasing you and you want to pass judgment on that. It, it's yeah. I I don't understand that line of reasoning. You know, it's like um, I, I did a radio show a while back, uh, night dreams talk radio and they had a call in portion and this lady from Colorado was really upset with my line of talking about these things and not trusting them. And, and her narrative was, I've been to the woods forever, never had a weapon. I had one come up behind me one time and nothing bad happened. And I just think, you know, it's overreacting and this and that. And I was like, okay. And that was where, you know, Colorado. And I was like, okay, we're we're talking about Alaska. Right. I'm not saying it's like that everywhere. I'm speaking only about Alaska. Yeah. And, you know, people are people. They just, they, I know. it's whatever. It, it's a, it's a lack of empathy, I think, in a lot of, a lot of ways and inability to yeah. put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And, and a bit of arrogance too. Like um, uh, I've met a lot of people that feel they're too smart to fall for or, or, you know, anything like that. And it's like, all right, those people, I just, I give them a lot of room because, exactly. you know, my dad always told me, you can't tell anybody anything that knows it all. That's you can't so tell true. them nothing. Yeah. If they a, know a it vessel. all, you can't yes. tell them nothing. Like a vessel that's already full. You can't, you can't yeah. add more to it. Well, you said something when we were speaking 
before we started recording that I thought was so brilliant about people making an assumption from a place of comfort. Yeah. Assumption from a place of safety is, safety, is so yeah. easy to do. It, yeah. It's, and of course, you know, when people are hearing these encounters, they're, they're replying to it with their own life experience. And that, you know, that's, that's limited. If your life experience is limited, you know what I mean? If you don't yes. go out in the woods like that, yeah. how, how would you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you could read books all day and, and watch everything you need to online to learn how to work a rod and reel and go fishing. <laughs> but until you grab that rod and reel and cast it out in the water, you don't know how to right. fish. Right. It, it's irrelevant. You know what I mean? You yes. got to, you got to put it into action. And you never know how you're going to react um, either. You know, a lot of people say, well, I would never do that. It's like, no, you don't. You have no idea what you would ever do if you were standing there facing something as massive as these creatures are. You don't know what, how right. your body's going to react. Yeah, because when I initially shot through the wall, that was autopilot. I wasn't going and reasoning with myself, oh, defender, you need to shoot now. No, no, it was none of that. It was boom, boom, boom. It, it was get off me. It, it was like, yeah. you know, uh, before Kerry Arnold passed, you know, he asked me, were you protecting your family? I was like, no, I was protecting myself. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they came into focus later, but in that moment when I was eye to eye with this thing, it wasn't, no one else existed. It was just, I had to, I had to defend myself. It wasn't, it wasn't some thought out plan of like, oh, I'm macho and I'm going to shoot it. it, it yeah. that, that just wasn't there. But, you know, your action saved y'all's lives because at that point, then they, they knew that you had firearms and that. Um... Right. And, and I think, you know, I, I think we changed their game plan because them luring out, luring us out for an ambush didn't work. And then we're shooting shortly after that. I think that had a large portion to do with how the rest of the night went because everything else they did was almost checking to see if we we're going to shoot again, you know? And so, yeah, I, I think it changed our game plan because, again, we, we could have easily walked around that corner and God only knows, you know? It, it, it would have been too late. We would have been too close to it and its size to have – really put up any kind of defense, yeah. you know, yeah. it was just, uh, oof. Yeah. you know, when, when I tried to share this experience with discovery channel last year, uh, expedition X, we were out in Willow. I was with squatch bait as I call him. Uh, he hates that. I, <laughs> I introduced him to Dr. Jeff Meldrum as squatch bait <laughs> up in Fairbanks last year. He, he's, he's like, you asshole. But anyway, so, <laughs> Um, it's funny to me, so I do it, but anyway, so, uh, we're with the discovery channel. It was about a year ago. Um, and they reached out to me wanting to their, their expedition X was coming up here and they're doing stuff on Alaska cryptids or something. And so I was like, yeah, <clears throat> anyway, through all the drama or whatever, and the back and forth, we ended up agreeing to do it and they asked me about someone else who would be willing to share and i i knew of him and his experience and i i pointed it out so they agreed and so we all were up in willow um at this location site nda and all that whatever yeah. but so i start sharing because the host jess the the girl host not the guy host um of that show was there and the other guy was somewhere else filming but anyway so she was there interviewing me and she asked me uh, a couple questions and asked me if I had any experiences. And I, I told her what I just shared with you and up until the point of uh, firing on it with the 30 odd six, everything was dead quiet. The whole crew, there was like uh, at least almost a dozen people all around us. Right. One of the camera guys uh, literally started getting ill and, and that portion, they didn't show any of that. I, I was on that show for 45 seconds, um, but it, irrelevant. They The check cleared, so it's all good. <laughs> but uh, they they literally left so much of what I gave them just out of it because I wouldn't do anything scripted. Yeah. Uh, I would not go against my, you know, my my moral compass. And they knew that going into it. So they had to keep it real cut and dry because they had hinted around at some things and I'm like, I, I ain't even, 
I'm only here to be interviewed and I'll go on my way. What you guys do with your show have at it, but I, yeah, I'm just here to give an interview. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a participant in that portion of your little expedition there. So wow, have fun. Yeah. Well, I, I so love your channel. I, I, uh, I literally just go there and spend, I'll spend the, the entire afternoon into the evening, just, just going from one show to the next show to the next show. I love the style of your show. I love what, I love your, I love the organic way that you tell the stories you know, you don't, right. you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to dramatize them. They're just, you're just telling what happened. And that's dramatic enough for these poor people who've had these, some of right. these harrowing experiences. Right. I just, I love your, I love your channel and I hope it just continues to grow. And, and I will definitely, I'll put the link down below and hopefully everybody that sees this will go to your channel and subscribe as well. And do you have memberships? Right, right. Do you offer memberships? No, no, I, I don't even push my own web store, Sabella. <laughs> I, I have two separate web stores that are underneath the the menu yes. at the website. But I, okay. So to share a, an elderly woman's encounter of not feeling safe at her own property, her husband had passed, and then to turn around and go, oh hey, by the way, I got new shirts. No, I, I totally that, get that it. That to me is yeah. the most tacky thing. It, it's yeah. there for people who happen to look for it yes. and. I rarely mention it. So, yeah. no, I love you know, it. I, I, it's not uh, a membership is something I couldn't do because I don't feel I could put a price on someone else's safety. That's just tacky. You yeah, know, no, um, I, get it. I totally get it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd rather share everything I come across versus make extra content for yeah. a, a, a paywall. It's right. just, I'm good. You know, I'll be all right. <laughs> No, I love that. And I love your, I love your map. Um, I love how you can click on your map. You know, you can go find a pin and you click on it and then either you're, you, uh, there's the written report sometimes, and then sometimes it's you telling the story of what yeah, happened at that yeah. location. Well, it, there's always, it's embedded with my YouTube channel. So my tech guy is a really good guy, Dave, the tech guy. Uh, God bless him. Uh, Cause I don't have that technical knowledge, but he took my idea and I laid it out for him and he, he nailed it. Um, and so you could pull up a pin, like you were saying, and it'll give a brief description. And then you have the option to just click right on the video from right there, um, which, you know, I, I think that's a lot. It makes it more accessible to people who go, oh, I got to go somewhere else now. Instead of having to backtrack out of there and go to YouTube and all that, they can go immediately right there. So, yeah. you know. It's basically a reference map so people can know, oh, hey, Kenai Peninsula, let's see, we're going to Ski Lake Lake. What's what's happening over there? And do you have advice for people, Fred, other than, um, you know, don't go looking for these things? Um, and, you know, if, if, you, if there's someone who finds themselves in a situation where they're, you know, face to face with these things, what's your advice? Uh, aim for soft tissue. <laughs> Center mass did me no good. Uh, shoot for the neck, eyes if you can see them, groin, knee, something like that. Uh, if it if it's aggressive. Other than that, um, you know, I honestly I I don't have an answer for that. You know, um, it's all situational. Of, it's all yeah, situational, exactly. isn't it? Yeah. And it's so random. I've talked to so many people that had guns in their hands, and the thought of a gun didn't even cross their mind because they're in shock of what they're seeing. Yes. And that's something that people sometimes they fail to recognize the shock to your system. Yes. I knew they existed, but to see that damn thing right there in my face, that was a shock. Like it, 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 you can't even put it in the words, you know, it, it's just, yeah, it, it just be careful. Um, grant you the more eyes out looking at, you know, looking for something, the more likely we're, you know, we're going to gradually get more evidence that's not just anecdotal. Right. But again, uh, you know, hopefully it's not at a huge cost. Yeah. But at this point, no one knows, you know. And, do, and don't be out there alone either. Oh, no, don't don't go alone, uh, especially in real remote areas. I, I mean, I go to certain places by myself, but I'm never alone, if that makes sense. Um 
always protect yourself. What's your life worth to you? Years ago, I worked armed security and I went to buy a bulletproof vest and I was complaining about the price, right? <laughs> and the sales guy, he goes, I was like, well, what's wrong with this? And this was 20 years ago, you know, uh, I was like, what's wrong with this one? That's 1200. And I said, this one doesn't look any different. And it's like three times that. And he goes, well, what's your life worth to you? And I was like, okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, fair enough. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's discuss level four, a body armor over here. Then, you know, I, I get it. But in the moment, people don't think about that. There there's, uh, there's the, your own human dynamic involved and you can mentally prepare as all as you want until that day happens and all your plans go out the window. You know, like Mike Tyson said, you have the best plans in the world till you get punched in the face. Then, you know, the, the plan's gone. Exactly. So just to be aware, sometimes your plans ain't shit. <laughs> and you just got to. So you true. just got to go with the, the motion of what's going on. Yeah, that is so true. If you ever have any witnesses that would like to have their sketches done, you know, that would that would be interested in, I mean, not necessarily for the channel, but if there's ever someone who got a really good look at it um, and they would like to have their encounter sketched, I don't charge witnesses for that. I would love to, okay. to work um, with them. With some. I, I know a few people that I could reach out to and see if they'd be interested for sure. Um most definitely. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm very interested in what people are seeing, you know, also. Yeah. 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 Because I always ask, what did you see? And, yeah. you know, I, I appreciate people being honest when they're like, I was freaked out. It was big and it was dark. Yeah. I, I, I respect that because that's real, you know. Yeah. Um, But for the most part, it, it, it's pretty standard. A lot of people will say uh, it looked more caveman like, like Neanderthal like versus an ape. Yes. You know, they would, you know, on a scale from gorilla to Neanderthal or caveman, they would lean towards caveman. Yeah, almost universally. Yes. You know what I mean? So yes. I'm not in the camp that they're big, dumb apes. I, mm -hmm. I think there's far more going on with them than we realize. I think they're uh, they're definitely an ancient being, in my opinion. I totally know? agree. And they've been around. They've been around long enough to know how to bypass us and how to surpass us out in the woods, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I yeah. think most of our lives are so patterned. We go to sleep at the same time. We get up at the same time. We do the same things. Yeah. All we have to do is a little reconnaissance to figure out how to avoid us. Oh yeah. Yeah. I would be easy to track if I was just doing my day to day, at, you know, <laughs> but you know, that's a, that's another thing. People, they get caught in their own bubble. Yeah. And even though they don't go out into the field or into the woods to do anything, they, they sometimes I feel they get caught up in these little chat rooms and these little echo chambers. Yes. And they get a false sense of what's really happening out there. You know, yes. um, I, I feel sorry for them because God forbid they have that, that moment where that chat room and all that crap they were talking about is all of a sudden a reality in front of them. And it has nothing to do with what the hell they were talking about. You know, that, that could really be dangerous for some people, you know. Absolutely. Well, you, in your, I think, you know, you're trying to mitigate that with what the knowledge that you're sharing. And I so deeply appreciate what you're doing. And um, I'll promote your channel however I can. <laughs> I just think you're No, I appreciate it. Yeah. If you let me know when this is going to air, I can make sure that people are aware of it and, awesome. you know, send them that direction. Um, the, the people who watch my show genuinely, uh, they're, they're really good people and stuff. They'll, they typically go and see whatever I'm, you know, being a part of or whatever. So, yeah. you know, let me know and send me a link or whatever. And I'll, I'll sure. make sure to send people that way for sure. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. You have a good one. We'll talk again soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.